We are several weeks into this Easter season sermon series called Dawn of the Living. And in those weeks, we have been talking about living life at a whole new level. Life with a capital L. The good and beautiful life. The abundant, overflowing, and everlasting life. And we have been wondering together where that kind of life comes from and how we might get some. Last week, I made bold to talk about Jesus as the source of that kind of life, the true vine in which we must abide. But at one point, I talked about the sap that flows from the vine to the branch, and I may have wrinkled up my nose when I said it, because I don't like the word sap very much. I've heard it used in a derogatory way, as in, don't be such a sap. But then I looked up the definition, and this is what I found. Sap is the fluid, chiefly water with dissolved sugars and mineral salts, that circulates in the vascular system of a plant. That doesn't sound so bad. Sweet and salty water circulating through the veins and arteries of a plant. It's the lifeblood, isn't it? It's what keeps the plant alive. And then I looked at the next definition. Vigor or energy, as in the hot, heady days of youth when the sap was rising. Some of the synonyms were drive, dynamism, life, spirit, liveliness, sparkle, verve, ebullience, gusto, vitality, vivacity, fire, zest, zeal, exuberance. Wouldn't you like to have a little of that flowing through your veins? Wouldn't you love for somebody to say, you are so full of sap? <laughs> Probably not. But it may be because of that third definition, which tells us that a sap is a foolish and gullible person. And that's why I don't like that word. But all those other things are good. And they give the impression that while the vine is the source of life, the sap that flows into the branches is the substance of life. For today's purposes, I'd like to call that substance love. Isn't that what life with a capital L is made of? Would it be possible to have an abundant, overflowing, everlasting life without it? I don't think so. In my first church, there was a woman who showed me the autobiography she was working on, and it was called A Life Without Love. As I turned those pages, I began to get the impression that her life had been deprived of any earthly expression of love. It was just about the saddest thing I had ever seen. And maybe that's why she came to church. And maybe that's why she kept on coming, because at church she heard about a God who loved the world so much he gave his son, and about a son who loved the world so much he gave his life. She heard that his love was available to anyone and everyone who believed in him, and that was the hard part for her, believing that anyone could love her but I just kept telling her it was true, that he really did love her, and I knew it because the Bible said so, and she kept hearing it and eventually began to respond to it. I can almost remember the day when she reached out with a trembling hand to attach herself to the true vine, and how she stayed connected to that vine, even during difficult times, stubbornly holding on until the love began to flow and that dry, withered branch that was her life began to grow again. 
And all of us who knew her in those days began to see the fruit coming on that branch, and she seemed to be the most surprised of all. This love is available to everyone, no exceptions. This life that we've been talking about, it is available to everyone, no exceptions. But you might still be wondering, where does it come from? How can I get some? When I sat down to work on this sermon last week, I looked at the first verse in today's reading where Jesus says, Just as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. And I got this picture of Jesus receiving love from his Father and sharing it with his disciples. And maybe it was because I was still thinking about that sweet, watery sap that flows from the vine into the branches, but I began to think about where we got our water when I was a boy. In the house that I remember best from my childhood, we didn't have running water. We had a well up on the hill about 200 yards away. And every once in a while, we would take a couple of buckets and walk up the path to the well and uncover it and take the bucket that was there and drop it down into the water 10 or 12 feet below. The bucket had a weight on one side so that it would tip over and fill with water. And if you let the rope down a little more, you could watch that bucket sink all the way to the bottom and all the way down. You could see it because the water was that clear. We would bring up that bucket and fill the buckets we had brought and put the cover back on the well and carry those buckets down to the house, water sloshing out the whole time. In the summertime, we would always leave one bucket on the back porch with a dipper hanging on a nail just above it. Anybody here remember dippers and what they look like? Do you remember buckets? This was a water bucket on the back porch with a dipper hanging right there. And when we got hot and tired from working in the garden or playing in the yard, we would come to the back porch and take that dipper and scoop up big, thirst-quenching dippers full of cool, clear water. There is almost nothing better than that. As I remember those days, I began to think about God as the well from which the water came and Jesus as the bucket in which it was carried, and us as the grateful recipients, scooping up dippers full of that life-giving liquid. But then I read on in this passage and heard Jesus talking about loving one another as he has loved us. And I pictured some of those neighbor kids who used to hang around our house in the summertime. Picture them holding out their cupped hands like this and asking, can I have some? And I pictured myself scooping up water and pouring it out into their cupped hands so that everybody could have something to drink. At its simplest, that's what this commandment is about. God, who is the source of all life and love, has sent his son Jesus to share that life and love with us. And Jesus has done it willingly, eagerly. He has poured himself out for us. And now he simply asks us to do the same for each other. In the other Gospels, he says, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He says you should love your neighbor as yourself. But in this gospel, John's gospel, he commands his disciples to love one another as he has loved them. Commands us to love one another. And I think he's talking about our life together here in the family of faith. Because the truth is, you can keep God at a distance up there somewhere. You can keep your neighbor at least one door away, but here in the church, we tend to bump into each other. And Jesus wants us to love one another 
And if the truth be told, there are some people here we don't like all that much. It's not that we hate them. It's just that people are people. We are naturally drawn to some, and we tend to avoid others. There may be someone here, when you see him coming down the hallway, or her, you find yourself suddenly ducking into an open door, remembering that you needed to pick up a pledge card from the finance office. Again, it's not that we hate these people. We just don't like them very much. But there they are, and here we are over and over again. If Jesus were standing in front of us today, we might ask, do we have to love these people? Yes, he would say. You have to. Do we have to like them? No, he would say. You don't. Just have to love them. Then how, you might ask, how am I supposed to do that? And I don't know what Jesus would say, but I do know what Frederick Buechner has said on this subject. He says, when Jesus commands us to love one another, he doesn't mean love primarily as a feeling. He means acting in the best interest of others no matter what, even if personally we can't stand them. And we can do that. That's why this kind of love can be commanded. We can act in the best interest of others, even if personally we can't stand them. When that person you are trying to avoid at church stumbles in the hallway, you should rush to her aid. In fact, Jesus says, you must, because that's what he has done for us. He has rushed to our aid. And I'm guessing that he did it for some of us when we really weren't all that likable. Speaking of unlikable, have I told you about my foster brother, Perry? Some of you may not know that my parents took in foster children as if it weren't enough to have five or six boys in the house already. They decided to add a few more. Maybe they had read that book, Cheaper by the Dozen. I don't know. <laughs> but first it was Bill and then Ori and Perry who were brothers and then George and finally Terry and a whole house full of boys. But it's Perry I want to tell you about because Perry was trouble. We were about the same age, and that may have been part of the problem. There may have been a rivalry there. But when I was sitting in a chair and Perry walked through the room, he would punch me hard on the shoulder and say, there, that'll make you tough. But it didn't. It made me sore, and, and I began to flinch every time he walked through the room. Suddenly, here I was, turning into this jumpy kid with bruises on both arms. Didn't know what was happening. Perry once threw a sledgehammer at me. Luckily, he wasn't very strong. It fell short by about six feet, but still, a sledgehammer. Another time, he threw a rubber mallet at me from close range, the kind of mallet you use for banging out dents in cars. And I was able to duck, but if I hadn't, there might have been a dent in my head that had to be beaten out. There was another time he tried to sweep my legs out from under me with a long two-by-four, and I was able to jump at the last second and avoid the impact but if I hadn't, something might have broken, and it might not have been the two-by-four. I wasn't any tougher, but my reflexes were amazing. <laughs> I feel sure that if I had known Perry's whole story, I could have been more sympathetic. I knew that he was an orphan, and that should have been reason enough. His Mother's Day and mine were very different stories. I knew his older brother tormented him in the same way Perry tormented me, but at least I could understand why. My mother had heard Perry's whole story from the social worker, and it must have been a doozy. 
because she seemed to feel sorry for this kid. She loved him like one of her own children. Back in those days, my mother spent a lot of time in the kitchen of that house, and it was a small kitchen. Lots of work to be done with no running water. She had to heat the water she used for cooking and cleaning. Spent a lot of time at that kitchen sink. But when she could take a break, she would come into the next room, which we called our dining room. Not that there was much dining that went on there. There was a table where we ate, the same table where we did all our homework in the afternoons. There were those steps going up where we thundered up and down like a herd of cattle. We went through that room to almost every other room in the house. It wasn't the kind of place you would go for rest. But there was a rocking chair there close to the fireplace, and when my mother had a few minutes, she would go and sit in that chair. I was at the table on the day Perry tried to walk past, and she reached out and grabbed his wrist and pulled him down into her lap. And she wrapped her arms around him tight, and he protested. He was 15 years old. He was way too old for that kind of thing. Let go of me, he said, struggling, squirming, kicking. But my mother was strong. You don't wrestle that many cast iron skillets without getting strong. She held on to him tight. Hers was the love that would not let him go. And that's when it happened. I saw this look flit across his face, a look that he would not have wanted me to see, a look that showed me how much he needed what he was getting from my mother. Love. He'd never had it before. It was easier for me to be sympathetic toward Perry after that. Everybody needs love. My mother had given me more than my share. She had dipped down into her bucket day after day and poured the substance of life into my cupped hands. I never had to wonder if she loved me. I still don't. And even though she pulled Perry down into her lap regularly after that, I knew he would never catch up with me. I had been inside the circle of that embrace a million times already. Which brings me to the last thing I want to say about this passage, at least for today. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. We talked about that word last week. Abide, how it is a relational word. When I think about my mother, I think about how I abided in her even before I was born. For nine months, while I was in her womb being shaped and formed, she loved me even though she hadn't met me. And when I came into the world, she took me into her arms. And for the first time, I found myself inside the circle of her embrace. I spent a lot of time there in the first few months of my life. And later when I learned to crawl and then to walk, and even when I found I could walk away from my mother to the other side of the room, I found it didn't matter. It didn't matter if I was outside the circle of her embrace. I was not outside the circle of her love. I could go off to kindergarten. I could go off to college. It didn't matter. I was still there inside that circle. And even if my plans in those early days had worked out, if I had become rich and famous and peeled out of her driveway in a Lambo spurting gravel and driving as fast and far away from her as I could, I still would have been inside the circle of her love. That's what I hear Jesus saying in this passage. He's getting ready to leave his disciples. They have been abiding in his presence for months, even years, but now suddenly find themselves hours away from his absence. What will they do? How will they go on under those circumstances? I'll tell you, he says. Abide in my love. 
as if he knew that circle stretches from heaven to earth. And that the only way we are going to get outside that circle is if we ourselves choose to step outside of it. Don't do that, Jesus says. Don't step out of that circle. Abide in my love. I believe that's where our life comes from. That Jesus is the source and love is the substance of life with a capital L. That good and beautiful life. Life that is abundant and overflowing and everlasting. I believe that life is available to anyone who chooses to step inside that circle. And that could be you. And this could be the day. Shall we pray? Jesus, thank you for sharing the Father's love with us and for commanding us to share that life and love with others. Maybe this is how we can do it, by inviting others into this circle, by pouring ourselves out in life-giving love just as you have poured yourself out for us. Give us the will to keep your commandment, for we ask it in your name. Amen.